Hollywood. The place so many post-production professionals are dreaming of working in. There's a lot going on here in Los Angeles. Many TV shows and movies are being produced in this city. But there are also a lot of people that want to be part of the industry and don't know how to get their foot in the door. Richard Sanchez is an assistant and VFX editor in Hollywood with more than 14 years of experience in post-production. He has worked on movies like Bill and Ted Face the Music and shows like Showtime's I'm Dying Up Here. And he knows from his own experience that starting out can be difficult. Richard, how did you get started in post-production? Did you go to film school? No, actually I didn't go to film school. I went to theater school. Um, when I was in college, I wanted to be an actor, so I studied acting. And in my last quarter, a friend suggested I take an editing class. And I was like, why would I do that? And I took the class and within about a week, I was like, this is all I want to do. Okay, crazy. Yeah. And then how did you, how did you, what was your first job? How did you get into TV and film production then. So, yeah, you know, it's it's funny. The, the, the gap between that moment in college versus my first job was kind of a long one. I ended up working at Starbucks for, gosh, four years before I landed my first, you know, major work, job in uh, post-production. And what I consider to be my first real job in post-production was I was a night assistant editor on a show called UFO Hunters for the History Channel. How did you then move over to Scripted? So, you know, that was certainly a tough transition because, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen how myopic uh, people can be about what you do. And, and the worlds are so insular. They're, you get locked into these, you know, mentalities of, oh, you do reality. You don't know scripted. Or, and, 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 and in my experience, it works in all directions. Like if you come from film, people tend to go, oh, you're a film guy. You, you don't know TV. You're not fast enough. And so for me, the transition was, um, it was kind of a stroke of luck in that at the time I was, you know, I had a lot of experience in reality and I found a show which was a scripted show that was masquerading as a reality show. So it was kind of one of those things where coming from reality, they're like, well, we need kind of people who understand reality, but it's scripted. So it was kind of like, oh, cool, I'll, I'll do that, you know, and mm -hmm. that was my first foray, you know, into it. And that was, I got that job from, of all places, entertainmentcareers.net. It was like those, it was one of those total dumb luck, just kind of like, I just happened to be looking at the website. And with websites like that, the problem is thousands of people are looking at these. So unless you get your email out like that, you mm -hmm. get buried in a mountain of resumes and they called me in and I got it, you know, and that was kind of the start of it. So, but you, you said for you, it was kind of luck, but do you think, is there a strategy for people that want to end up in scripted television or scripted features? How, how can they get there? You know, I, I do think there is value in being proactive mm -hmm. and it's a very fine line to straddle because you can be proactive but it's also important to recognize when you border on being irritating. You know, we're all kind of in the same boat. We all know that it's based on relationships. And, you know, when you click with someone, it seems that it would be an eventuality that you go, oh, I could spend 14 hours in a cutting room with this person, you know, and so, you know, but but there's something about not being over eager because I think there there's a danger to when you make it about getting a job. It, it, it makes people feel like you're treating them like an asset as opposed mm -hmm. to a person. And and for me, I think one of the biggest discoveries for uh, being proactive is just just kind of boiling down the notion of networking which is like it's it's kind of an, an icky word in some senses and the, and then when you really think about it like the value of it is when it's about friends when it's just like you're a cool person i want to be your friend and you know what you're a cool person who does what i do yeah we should probably work together you know i think when things develop organically things work out better but you know there's a sense of not rushing it and not being over eager and mm -hmm. and and if you are going to be deliberate and if you are going to be direct 
be actually be direct, you know, in the sense of if you're going to tell someone, hey, I want to work with you. I'm impressed with your work. I want to work with you. I'm not even going to play games. Let's, you know, like, and I've known people who that's worked and I think that's impressive. And in, in my experience, I, was, I told you earlier, I had an experience where this happened to me is I reached out to someone and I had a mutual connection to a film that I really wanted to be a part of. And I kind of went through my, my list of friends who had a connection to this person on the film. And I reached out to this friend and I just said, hey, this person's working on this film. I really want to be on this film. Would you make an introduction for me? And so my friend agreed to make an introduction and they reached out and they didn't get back to me. So I waited about a week and they still didn't get back to me. So I just kind of, you know, I don't want to be obnoxious. I don't want to badger them. And so I gave it about, you know, a few more days and I just emailed and I just kind of said, you know, because the one thing I think it's important to note to note too when you're trying to insert yourself into a team is most people who've been doing this for more than a few years kind of already have their their team. And so when you come about and say, I want to be your assistant, if you really think about it, you're sort of talking about displacing someone else who's already working for them. So it's kind of like, who, who are you who thinks you're just going to take the job of my assistant? So I reached out to them and I said, look, I'm sure you guys already have a team. I'm sure you already, but you know what? If you need a hand down the road, just this film is, I'm so excited for what it's going to be. And, you know, best of luck on the film. And then a week later, they're like, oh yeah, we're looking for someone. It's like, Oh my God, you know? And so I think there's something about like, you know, not make it about pressure and not make it about me getting something from you, not make it about me using you, but Hey, you know, I kind of want to do, you know, I, there's, I think we could work well together, you know, mm. yeah, that, makes... I, that was long. That was very long winded. <laughs> you know? No, it makes, it makes it. Nobody wants to be used. Nobody wants to um, That's it, be in a, you know? in a and... fr friendship relationship and then realize after weeks, months, or maybe years that, it wasn't a friendship and, and you know i i think cynically uh people like to say you know like in la everyone's fake in la everyone's fake and you know like i understand where that saying comes from but there's also an acknowledgement too that as a freelancer we all you know we all know we're going to work for eight months and then be out of a job so i mean there, it doesn't need to be a shameful thing to go hey um you know my job ended and i'm looking for a new one because really that's all there is to it you know and so you you created an online class together with film editor lawrence jordan and that's correct it's called master the workflow what is that about when you go to film school You can take classes on editing and that's great and that's awesome and you should learn about you know the philosophical approach to making an edit and what makes a good edit and you know get into the mindset of an editor but not a lot of schools really dive into the minutia of the assistant editor and so there is a sense of like it, it, it's interesting how many people come out of you know prestigious film programs and you know I mean, in the old days, it would be like, you know, running tape, you know, it's like, that's cool that you went to this amazing film school, but I need you to black and code tapes and I need you to lay this off to this. And I need you, and it's like, oh gosh, what is that? You know, so we realized there was a gap that we could fill there. And so we just kind of sat down and said, you know, okay, let's just, let's take this from the beginning. Because the other issue that often happens too is, Everyone says, uh, you know, well, if you want to learn how to be an assistant editor, you got to shadow assistant editors. And even that, as great as that is, comes with its own set of problems. Because, for example, if you shadow an assistant editor who's in the middle of dailies, you're going to learn how to do dailies, but you're not going to learn how to do turnovers. Or if you shadow an assistant editor who's at the end of a project, you're not going to learn how to organize dailies. Or if you want to learn comping, or if you want to learn visual effects tracking, it'll be like, hey, I want to learn this. It's like, oh, I'm actually not doing that yet. We're, we're months away from that. So this became the opportunity of us to to take footage from a short film and just go, well, let's let's break down the whole process beginning to end. You know, this way you don't you're not at the mercy of where the project is you know, that you're going to try to get out to. And I still highly recommend people shadow assistant editors mm -hmm. if they can, because I think the one thing that's so important is every film, we basically do 
the same thing in different ways. And the wonderful thing about that is you can watch how other people do something that you've done a thousand times before. And there's always that wonderful moment when you see someone do something that you, you know, you, you think you know the, the right way to do. And you see someone else, you go, oh my God, how did you do that? That's, that changes everything, you yeah. know? And so yeah. there's a lot, a lot of value in seeing how other people work. Oh yeah, absolutely, 100%. So who, who can sign up for your class? Who, who is this class for? It's open to the general public. Uh, we open it up quarterly. And for members of the Motion Picture Editors Guild, uh, uh, MPEG members can sign up at any time just by emailing us at uh, info at masterstheworkflow.com. We have students in several different countries, and uh, we're just wow. we're, we're really happy how, uh, how receptive people have been to it. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. And a lot of assistant editors, I think, are trying to become editors at some point not all of them but but i think a lot mm -hmm. and to me it feels like the assistant editor and the editor those two jobs are they are very different jobs they i feel like they have ve little almost little to do with each other um do you yeah. what do you think how how can assistants learn what they need to know to become editors you know one thing that you hear a lot of editors say time and time again is you know that editing can't really be taught you just kind of need to do it because it, it, it's really interesting too there I, I find reading different books on editing there are some some rules I agree with and some rules I disagree with mm -hmm. and it's the, the therein lies kind of where your own tastes you know and and sentiments you know um will play into the cut and the, into the storytelling process. But I think to a large degree, it's important that, you know, one just practices and, you know, kind of sees what makes a cut work or not work. And in addition to that, also gain a sense of understanding why you made a cut. I think early on in one's edit editing career, you're gonna, you're gonna make cuts, you know, in, that are probably not gonna be extremely thoughtful. You might make them more rhythmically. You might make them, you know, like now it's time to go to a wide. And then over time, there'll be a little bit more justification and ability to explain why you needed to go where. Because, you know, like, I think, you know, early on in your editor's cut, you know, you're gonna make things that, you're gonna make your editorial decisions based on pacing and kind of what facial reactions you want to see. And then you start running into, you know, the dreaded continuity uh, issues and, you know, start, you start making a distinction where you have to address things technically and where, you know, you can let them go either due to the fact that the performance was better here or, you know, like what compromises you're willing to make. And I think you only really understand those when you do them and you know because i think a large part too that uh, that isn't always talked about like i kind of you know it might be a controversial standpoint but i, I actually think the editing of the film itself at times becomes almost a smaller role than talking to you know the studio and the decision makers you know like you as the editor kind of also need to balance politics mm -hmm. uh and opinions and quite honestly egos mm -hmm. and and being able to manage people and manage expectations and you know really understand how to talk to people in a creative setting sometimes you know there's the old situation where if you are passionate about a decision that you want made and someone is fighting you on it, sometimes the way to get that done is to sort of suggest it to someone else and make them think it's their idea. And then they think it's genius and you go, cool. Well, I guess I won my battle because I got the thing I wanted, you know? And different people respond to things different ways. And I, and I hate to sound so machiavellian about it like it like it's this big you know manipulation game but i mean at times it can be yeah. but also you learn when you need to throw in the towel and go you know what i'm passionate about this and the boss the you know the studio the producer the executive producer is not going to let me have it so 
I lost this battle, you know? And I think, I think that's a difficult thing too, because it's hard to not take ownership of like, of, of a project. You, you get so invested in it. You know, we, 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 most people, you know, are, who come into this field, they they love films, they're passionate about films and what a wonderful thing that you can make a living working on films, you know, but having the confidence to step back and go, Technically, it's not my film, though. I didn't finance it. I didn't pay. Someone else is paying for it. So, you know, while you want to bring everything you personally can to it and bring your personal stamp to it, it can be a very difficult reality to face when when you are in that situation where, you know, like, okay, this isn't working. And, I, you know, I've heard stories about people getting into shouting matches and whatnot. And for, for me, I, I'm... I'm not really that person. I'm kind. Of, I'm kind of like let's 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 just be cool. What do you want? Let's talk about yeah. what you want. Okay, I think I can get you there. Why don't you hear me out? Here's how I think I can get us there, and here's why I think this is a good choice to be made. And you know, if I win, I win, and if I lose, well, that sucks. But mm -hmm. it's gonna it's gonna happen. You mm -hmm. know, I I understand the emotions though, as as an editor who becomes attached to what what you're creating and you at some point maybe you there are certain things that you just laugh about and they, they don't have to do anything with yourself but just maybe with the story or the footage or i don't know what it is and there are other people that tell you to change <laughs> to change it and you get you're sitting there get frustrated and think that is i don't think that's the right call <laughs> And, and, and it can be so tough. I always find it funny if you talk to an editor about a project that they worked on or, you know, if you ever see them like watch something they worked on. It's always funny to like see them flinch and, you know, be like, Ugh, and because they remember all the stories and all the things they, you know, they loved about it or they hated about it. And it's always, I always find it funny because, you know, as a as a audience member that's you know separated from all that you you go oh why why did you respond that way it's like mm -hmm. oh man i still remember i hated that performance and i had to do that and it's always so funny it's like wow i didn't catch any of that that's so mm -hmm. funny that you were so passionate about that you know yeah. and uh i think one of the most dangerous things you know people get locked into is like this the whole idea of you know a good film or a bad film it's just like i mean it's 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 who's to say because it's such a subjective thing you know and especially with something as like like with comedy especially you know like comedy is so subjective you know that it's like i don't know how many shows you know like you're sitting there watching and you know like you're like i don't get it but everyone else is laughing i feel like i should be but you know <laughs> What would be your advice for young people that want to work in Hollywood? What can be their first steps? Honestly, be kind, be patient. And the one thing I will say in this modern age of social media, you should always assume if you publicly criticize a film that you are saying it to the face of that editor and director and producer because It's a small community. You're probably closer to them than you think, even though sometimes you feel a million miles away. And it's just never worth it. The industry is as cutthroat as people make it, and it can be exceedingly cutthroat at times. But I've found for me that I've generally um, sought out people who are kind and enjoyable and most people that's exactly what they want we're going to be spending 14 hours a day in a room with people and i'd rather it just be enjoyable the, the quote by maya angelou absolutely stands true which is that people will never remember what you said people will never remember what you did people will always remember how you made them feel And, you know, like I've certainly had that experience where I've worked on something, I was proud of it, and I knew it had faults, and someone just publicly badmouthed it. And I'm sitting there going, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything, but I tend to remember those names, and I just go, yeah. it's not worth it. Just, it's not, it's not worth it for anyone. Overall rule. Yeah. be kind that's yeah I, i absolutely agree richard thanks so much for for all your insights yeah. for taking the time absolutely. for talking to me it was really great absolutely yeah